we're ready to begin. Um, I think everybody can hear me. Good evening and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. My name is Kai Bird and I'm the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I want to thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on Wednesday, March 2nd at 6 p.m. to discuss Nicole Rudick's biography of the artist, Nikki D. St. Bail. She will be in conversation with our own Dan Nadell, one of this year's Leon Levy Biography Fellows. Please mark your calendars and register for this free event on the Leon Levy website. And if you have not done so already, please register your email address on our website so that you can be notified of our future events. But tonight we are here for a quite exceptional roundtable discussion devoted to a discussion among four prominent biographers on how they choose their subjects. Judith Thurman will moderate this Zoom roundtable of panelists who include Paul Oster, Stacy Schiff, and Martha Saxton. Briefly, Judith Thurman, who delivered the annual Leon Levy lecture in 2020, has been contributing to The New Yorker since 1987. She is the author of Isaac Dennison, The Life of a Storyteller, which won the 1983 National Book Award for Nonfiction and served as the basis for Sidney Pollack's Oscar-winning film, Out of Africa. Her other books include Secrets of the Flesh, A Life of Colette, and Cleopatra's Nose, 39 Varieties of Desire, a collection of her essays. Paul Oster is the best-selling author of Burning Boy, The Life and Work of Stephen Crane, and also the novels 4321, Winter Journal, Sunset Park, Invisible, The Brooklyn Follies, The Book of Illusions, and the New York Trilogy, among many other works. In 2006, he was awarded the Prince of Asturias Prize for Literature. Martha Saxton has published biographies of Jane Mansfield and Louisa May Alcott. Being Good, Women's Moral Values in Early America, which came out in 2003, is a study of women's behavior in three communities. In 2019, she published The Widow Washington, The Life of Mary Washington, and she is currently working on a study of Edward Gibbon. Please look for all these books online at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your favorite local independent bookstore. Judith will now guide the conversation among the panelists for about 50 minutes, and then we'll take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the chat box below to type in your questions, and Judith will be sure to get to as many as she can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. Judith Thurman, I now turn the rest of this evening's event over to you. Thank you so much, Kai. I just want to add that Stacy Schiff, um, I'm not sure we we uh, introduced her. Uh oh, did I skip over Stacy? I think that means I don't have to be here, doesn't it? <laughs> didn't right I, just where you are, I, just, I just got the get out of class free, didn't I? Oh, no. no. My apologies. Uh, but I will leave it to Judith to introduce okay. Stacy. And maybe Stacy's going to add. Stacy is the brilliant and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning biographer of Vera Nabokov, Benjamin Franklin, Cleopatra, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, and also a group biography of the witches' study of the witches of Salem. Um, and she's one of the most um, brilliant literary biographers that we have. So voila. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I, I sort of wanted to kind of cook this up partly to have uh, my ideal dinner party of biographers and writers in one place. Um, I think that what you're doing next is probably <laughs> the most common question a biographer gets asked. And when you've just finished a book after years or decades in some cases, uh, it's a question that arouses a lot of anxiety, if not actual anguish. <laughs> um, some of us need a long vacation. 
and others, mostly the Brits, I have to say, uh, plunge into a new book on lunch the day after their last one is published. That was never my case. But um, choosing a new subject is, in my own experience, a bit like contemplating remarriage. Uh, you know the pitfalls of the institution, you know the ups and downs that a relationship can have, but you also, here's sort of Pache Oscar Wilde, you know the potential for passionate engagement, not only with the individual subject, but um, with the mysteries of human nature. So that's kind of the, the, the ground I hope we'll talk about tonight and other things too, uh, from different perspectives. Um, so first I'd like to start with Paul because his departure is probably the most radical uh, from writing fiction, which he's been doing at the highest level of art and adventure for 40 years and happy birthday, by the way. You. Um, you're now a member of the club. Uh, is, it was very dramatic. So it's rare for a novelist to, especially a major novelist to take a detour into biography. Virginia Woolf did it, uh, not that successfully, but um, so I, would you tell us how, why you decided to, at the, at a mature moment in your career, why you decided to embark on a biography of Stephen Crane? Well, there are two things. I don't want to go on too long, but um, biography has always fascinated me. And in, and in quite a few of my novels, there are elements of biographical um, insights. In other words, there could be a character who's enlisted to tell the story, or write the story of another character. This has happened several times in my books. And I've often thought about writing biographical essays of figures that I'm interested in, and have never really gotten around to doing it. But, but I'm, I'm, I do read biographies. I'm interested in the form. So in this case, what happened was this. I, it was 2016, and I had finished writing the longest novel of my life, uh, 4321, which had absolutely exhausted me. Uh, I, I knew that I would have to take time off, that unlike your British friends, there was no way I was going to start anything else for, for a few months at least. It was, I think, the first time I, I gave myself license to have a holiday. No writing, just stop. And so I spent those months reading books that I had always meant to read and hadn't, watching films I'd always meant to see and hadn't, and any number of other things getting my teeth fixed and, and all, all sorts of important uh, jobs. All right, at one point, um, I was scanning the books on my shelf and thinking about what do I want to read next? And I stumbled upon my old Viking portable edition of Stephen Crane. Now, I hadn't read Crane since I was about 19 or 20 years old. And I thought to myself, I have to give him another chance. Let's, let's, let's see. And I opened up the book, which was about 500 pages worth of selected material, and stumbled upon a novella entitled The Monster. I'd never heard of it, and I certainly had never read it. And I was absolutely flattened by the brilliance of this 60-page work written in 1897. So I started going through the entire book, uh, more and more amazed by the brilliance of this writing and how, uh, how many varied forms he worked in. I graduated then, and this is just purely for the pleasure of it, to the Library of America edition, which had about 1,400 pages. I said, I'm just going to read everything in it, which I did, and was still convinced that I had stumbled upon a, a mostly ignored now American genius. I, I, then I got hold of the collected works of Stephen Crane, University of Virginia Press, 10 volumes, over 3,000 pages of published work by someone who died at age 28. I mean, get that into your brain. He wrote all that and died at 28. I started investigating his life, and um, which was absolutely fascinating. Uh, uh, incredible life filled with all kinds of hair-raising adventures. And I thought to myself, well, I think I should write an appreciation of Crane, a little book, maybe 150, 200 pages, just to express my admiration. Well, Judith, one thing led to another. And, uh, <laughs> the more deeply I got into it, 
the more there was to tell. And so instead of a little book, I wrote a gigantic book. And um, I apologize to the world for that. But I, I really bore into it. I mean, it was the, the thing I was doing during the dark days of the Trump administration and, uh, and how, how interesting it was to be in the 1890s in America and to see how many similarities there were between that period and our own. And um, uh, it was an incredibly e exciting experience for me. And, and uh, I'm glad I did it. I have no intention of writing another biography, but I'm glad I did this one. And um, I think Crane deserved this kind of full bore attention. It was, a, it was a labor of great love and a labor of great eloquence. Not all love is eloquent, but yours is. Um, I, I should just say the last thing, my only intention in writing the book was to get people to start reading him again. That's all I, that's all I want is that his name will start being thought about again. The best biographies send you back to their subjects. I think that's, that's true. Um, Martha, you and I have uh, always written about the lives of women or mostly about women. And in your case, about American women. Um, and you're now working on the life of Gibbon, an 18th century Englishman educated in Switzerland and a scholar of ancient history. Um, but I want to get back to that. But before we do, I want to talk about a different departure, which was your first. Uh, because in 1975, you made your debut as a biographer with Jane Mansfield and the American 50s, which is an extraordinary book. It's, you can still get it. It's hard to find. Which was the first feminist biography of a sex goddess. And it was both a radical departure in terms of a subject for um, a scholarly person such as yourself, and it was a radical critique of a culture that hadn't been looked at through those eyes. So can you talk about the genesis of that little? Sure. Um, you know, I was part of that generation that you were part of, too, the sort of the, the whiplash generation who we grew up in the 50s and were told a certain set of truths about how to behave as women. And then we confronted the 60s and the early 70s and we're told another set of truths about how to behave as women. And Mansfield, I was, I was very, um, you know, I was a feminist, obviously, and came to it pretty naturally. And I was very influenced by Nancy Milford and by Kate Millett and the books that were coming out in the, in the I think those both came out in the 70s. And I wanted to make some sort of contribution, um, but I wanted to look at somebody who, other feminists might not think was worth looking at in some ways. And yet it seemed to me that her sort of rise and fall had um, an enormous amount to tell us about the rise and the, the, the sort of the pitfalls of the sexual revolution. I mean, she was, she was the iconic definition of feminism up to a certain point. And then all of the ground changed totally under, under her. We were all supposed to suddenly women were no longer supposed to tease or be pouty and be pink and be, uh, you know, everything but sex and all of that. We were, we were suddenly supposed to be authentic sexual selves and, and, and find um, a sexual life that was, that was good for us and wholesome for us. Um, I, these were, it, this was for me very hard to put together in my in my uh, 20, 25 year old brain. Um, and Mansfield had made a career out of the first, you know, the first part of that equation. And then when, when it came to uh, the moments in the 60s, uh, when, when things started to really change, her whole persona kind of suddenly looked tawdry and, and shabby and as if, uh, as if there was something disgusting about what she what she was, which hadn't been true before, and and her her effort it seemed to me terribly poignant. This effort to ride as a woman to objectify herself, but to sort of ride a kind of sexual persona, and then have it utterly fall apart on you and sort of you know um, uh, lead her to you know terrible nightclubs, bad decisions, and and soft, soft porn movies and so on. So um, I, I was trying to understand the sexual revolution through her. It wasn't a terribly successful 
uh, or, or I think you have to wait 40, 50 years to really understand what, what happened at the time. But, and certainly one thing that I think was, was evident even at the time was that you can have a sexual revolution of sorts. Um, certainly this was a pretty small bore one on college campuses for, for white middle-class kids, but you can, you can have one, but you can't, it won't mean very much unless there's a surrounding revolution of equality because you can't simply have equal sex, um, equally chosen, equally desired in a world in which nothing else between the genders is, is equal. So those were some of the uh, problems and, and themes I was trying to get at in that book. Um, I, I recently reread it, and it's a, it's an extraordinary perspective of a time that I lived through, but didn't see through see through 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 that that lens. And I, I, I did you get any um, flack uh, from feminists for having chosen Jane Mansfield, or from other people for having written about her in a in a? Um, no, I think I. It was it was um, largely ignored, except by people who wanted a holiday book, uh, a holiday uh, Hollywood book, which I had not done. I you know, I did the best I could with. I went out there, I interviewed people, and so on, but I really didn't know Hollywood, and I actually wasn't terribly interested in it. Um, so I think the the things that people expected from and wanted from that book were um, precisely what wasn't there. Um, and the people who were thinking about feminist questions weren't reading that book. So it was, it was a bit at cross purposes with itself. Very noble though. Um, Stacey, you have one of the most adventurous and distinguished bibliographies I can think of. Um, your career has, has in essence been a series of very daring departures from the most public and mythical of women, Cleopatra, to the most reserved and private, Vera Nabokov, from Ben Franklin to Saint-Exupéry, um, and from individuals to a group. Uh, so it's mis what you make these leaps all the time. What leads you? Is there a thread that connects the subjects that we don't see? Is there, is it restless curiosity? Is it kind of wanderlust? What, what moves you from one subject to another? I think the only suggestion you didn't make was ADD, which is also a possibility, <laughs> right? Um, you know, I, I, I think in a funny way, we're all touching on similar things. And, and, and Judith, I think this may sound familiar to you as well. I mean, yes, there's, a, there's the voracious curiosity, I think that we all have to just di dive into a subject and know everything, every corner of it insofar as we're able. And I think that behind that, um, invisible perhaps to the reader, sometimes invisible to the biographer too, are the questions with which one is grappling. And I often don't see those until after I've written the book. I mean, I'm vaguely aware that I meet, I'm setting out to answer some kind of query and only years later does it dawn on me what I was really after. Um, with, the witch, with the witches, for example, and this took a friend to point out, I hadn't noticed that my daughter was the same age as the girls who were convulsing in the minister's house in Salem in 1692, um, I had noticed that my daughter was the same age. And obviously there was something there for me about grappling with um, adolescence as well as everything else that was going on. Um, so I think that there's the there's this triple header in a funny way, it's a, a different form sometimes. I mean, I haven't wanted to write the same book twice. Um, I think after Cleopatra, every, Eastern and Western sovereign's name was, female sovereign's name was mentioned <laughs> to me. Um, and I just really didn't want to write about the Queen of Sheba or Elizabeth. I mean, it just, <laughs> I, I kind of had said everything I had to say about women in power. And, and I still feel I said pretty much everything I had to say about women in power and I was done and I was ready to think about something else. But I also wanted to write a different kind of book. And, and maybe that's where the ADD comes in. I mean, I just think, and I think we've all done that. I mean, Paul particularly. Um, you want to experiment with the form a little bit. I mean, some things are more character studies, some things are fuller length portraits, some things are group biographies, um, and, the, and the different sets of materials too, I think leads you, I mean, after the Ben Franklin book, I swore I would simply never work in French archives again, period, no matter what happened. Um, and so that was, I'm sure how Cleopatra happened, because that would be obvious, right? But they're just, there were just certain places where you can't, which were sort of no fly zones archive wise and certain places where um, I just thought, wow, this is an extraordinary cache of materials. Wouldn't it be 
um, brilliant to be able to do something with this. Do you know what you're doing? Do you know what you are you doing something at the moment? Do you know what you're going to do next? I seem to have written a biography of Samuel Adams, <laughs> which which falls directly upon one on Salem 1692, right? Um, for reasons that I don't think any of us needs to go into, it was 2016, and I was looking for somebody who represented something sterling about liberal democracy, and I also was just very pointedly looking for. I, I was meant to. I meant to write about a medieval woman, and I and literally her books were to the right in the library. My feet kept going left. I, I wanted <laughs> to write about somebody who changed the world, or I wanted to write about a life, um, which was really a pivotal life where you could actually put cause and effect together and say that this person, and in this case, a misunderstood person, had actually done something quantifiable. Um, and I think we've all talked to that, by the way, the dual, the dual writing into a void, pulling somebody out of obscurity, or pulling somebody out from under the misconceptions. You know, I think each of you has made a version of the same point that you were moved to write a book um, because of what was happening, uh, the French would say, at the, at the moment, politically in this country, or um, uh, to examine history, to examine a, an example, to, to see if you could understand it better. Um, does that apply to Gibbon, Martha? Is that what well, do you Gibbon? Uh, it absolutely applies to why I began thinking about Gibbon. Um, I, I, it was, you know, 2018 or 2017. I had, I had retired, and like Paul, I had a moment to sort of read what I wanted to read. I'd never read The Decline and Fall, and so I did. Um, it was a very dark moment, and I thought maybe he would shed some light on it, that he, he would have things to say, about, would have had things to say about uh, ways that we could, we could think about the, the present uh, catastrophe that, that we seem to be in. Um, that didn't turn out to be, <laughs> that didn't turn out to be what, what sort of riveted me to, to give, and it took quite a long time. First of all, it takes a very long time to read the book. It's, you know, 3,000 pages. And, um, it takes a long time to sort of think about what he's saying, and it 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 uh, it took me a long time to to uh, think about what troubled me about the book, and sort of come up with um, a, a sort of a set of problems that that um, seemed interesting to me to uh, to explore, um, and one of them was that he's an enlightenment historian he admired voltaire he admired hume he admired all of these other remarkable enlightenment historians who were not misogynist gibbon on the other hand is intractably misogynist it's kind of crazy he doesn't even write very much about women but the sort of the involuntary um uh trashing of of, of empresses particularly um, is is and the, and the sort of the salacious uh, treatment of them just really struck me. I was I was I was uh, very surprised. I was also more surprised on a deeper level at um, he was Gibbon was in Parliament at the time that he wrote much of the um, decline and fall, and he was uh, vehemently opposed to. To the American Revolution, to losing the colonies, to he was um, a committed British imperialist. And as I began to find out more about him, he didn't start out his life that way. He started out his life in Switzerland, uh, exiled from home because he he uh, had the temerity to, to turn into a Catholic. His father had to had to uh, refashion him as a as a Protestant. And in those years, he was neither a misogynist fell in love with a lovely woman, uh, had, uh, uh, nor was he uh, particularly an imperialist. He was, he was kind of an internationalist. He, he wrote about Republican values and so on. So, so I was very curious about this real transformation when he goes back. He, he talks a lot in his, in his memoir about becoming, re-becoming an Englishman or going back to England and learn, having to learn to become an Englishman. And it seemed to me that it was a pretty dreadful story, the, the story of his becoming an Englishman. And so 
the historian in me wanted to know how historians are made and how they're how they grow, how they're influenced, how they change. And that those all became part of what I what I wanted to find out about. Um, I, this is the second time I've mentioned Oscar Wilde, excuse me, but he, he wrote, all criticism is a form of autobiography, he wrote, and biography is a form of criticism. So I'm wondering if you would agree with that and to what, and if so, to, to what degree does each of you uh, address the urgent personal questions in your own life and art in writing about someone else's and discovering those questions. And, and Paul, since you sort of this, you fell in, well, it wasn't that you fell in love with Crane, but you, you made this in a way um, gift to Crane of this biography. What, tell me what, where, what, if, if that applies to you, if, it, if, if this is in some ways autobiographical or has it? Not really. Although, um... I mean, I mean, there is the curious fact that Crane and I were both born in Newark, New Jersey. But so what? I mean, he was born in 1871. <laughs> His father was a Methodist minister, and I was born into a Jewish family uh, in another Newark altogether. Uh, we were both passionate baseball players in our youths. So what? I mean, so were millions of other Americans. I can't think of any other two biographical connections. On the Picture. other hand, one of the things that I could really understand was uh, the hard knocks that Crane took as a young, young writer when he was just getting started. The rejections, the difficulties in getting published, um, and his uh, stubborn stick to which is something that um, I, I, could, I could understand very deeply because I'd been through all that myself. And I think that attitude of the young writer fighting for his life is something that got me into this. And, um, and so, but it's not autobiographical. It's just that my own personal history had schooled me in the kinds of things he was living through. So I felt I was able to get into it and, and, and write about it correctly. Um, uh, I think that, uh, and then of course, the big thing is, there's a lot of information about Stephen Crane, but there's also, there are many, many gaps. There are blanks and things that no one has ever been able to find. And um, I don't think ever will be found. I won't go into all the little details, but so you have to use your imagination also to, to fill in these blanks, not to you know propose solutions to what happened so much as to try to understand the continuity of the life even though we don't have the whole story. Um, so this, this was you know, a challenge in, in a way. The other thing that I wanted to do in this book, which is not about biography at all, is fully half the book is reading Crane's texts. Everything from the journalism to the poems, to the short stories, the novels, and the war journalism. You know, He covered two wars one in Greece and the other in Cuba, the Spanish-American War. Um, so um, there's such a, a, a plenitude of material and the writing is so incredibly vivid. I, Crane had an ability, which I have rarely seen in any other writer. Um, I think maybe Virginia Woolf had it also. Uh, little bits of Gerard Manley Hopkins prose have it is a kind of tactile connection with uh, the perceived world and, and an ability at the same time to translate those perceptions by this very highly sensitive person into language. Um, you know, and he could write, you know, a sentence. He was writing about Cuba. Um, it was a, a PC he was doing, and you know, the temperatures were 100 degrees during the war. It was stifling. More soldiers died of illnesses and infections than bullets. It was uh, very, very dangerous, a lot of disease. <clears throat> and he just, he writes, he says, the sky was bare and blue and hurt like brass. And I think, wow. Well, that's a good sentence. <laughs> how, does, how does the sky hurt like brass? 
Well, you have to think about it too. And then I imagine someone taking a, a brass platter out into that baking sun and just keeping it there. And what would it feel like to touch that brass, you know, after the sun had been pounding on it? I think that's what he had in mind. But there are thousands of instances of this kind of writing so that it's, it, you never get bored reading him. Um, as I said somewhere, you know, the novelists from a previous generation, like, and we love them all, you know, Dickens and Tolstoy and Balzac, you could curl up on a sofa and, and read them and really get swept away by these stories. Crane is concise and, and, and punches you in the face and you have to read him sitting bolt upright in your chair. And this is something I like about him too, because he, I feel, really was the, the beginning of modernism in America. He opened the door for everyone who came after him, but he was the first one. And uh, uh, I won't go on much longer, but just think about the Red Badge of Courage, something he wrote when he was 22 and 23 years old. And um, it's a novel, as everyone knows, set in the Civil War. Um, and there were many war novels in, in the history of the novel before this. He never mentions the name of the war. He never mentions what people are fighting about. He never even mentions the names of the two sides. He never brings up the word slavery. He never mentions the name Abraham Lincoln or a single general. He's in a phenomenological ground inside the head of a 16 or 17 year old boy thrown into combat for the first time. It is, it is so uh, much marked by what's not in it as what is in it that I think he that makes a line between the conventions of the 19th century and what the 20th century was going to do after him. And that's why it's so exciting to, to, read, to, read, to read the work. Um, so half life, half what he wrote. That's, that's how it breaks down. I actually counted the pages at the end. <laughs> and it just fell out about 50-50. I want to clarify something by, by autobiographical. It wasn't a well-chosen word. Uh, because I remember when I was writing Denison, after Denison was published, uh, someone was sent to interview me. And she, she, I had been picked of four biographers to be the one who identified with her subject. And she tried to get me to say how I identified with my subject. I, said, I didn't. I, we were completely different. We, I blah, blah, blah. And finally, I, she wanted something and, and I felt bad for her. And so I said, well, I discovered three or four years in that, that my favorite perfume was also her perfume. <laughs> and the, the story came out and it was in Time Magazine. And Thurman identified with her subject so much that she wore her perfume to evoke her presence. Uh, <laughs> but there's, a, there's this, an emotional, or there's an identification in my own experience has to take place um, not on the not on the basis so much of how you resemble someone, but on a sort of deeper sense of how the psyche works. And I wonder if uh, uh, Stacy, you who have navigated two millennia of history and subjects of all different walks of life and and cultures, what is the personal element for you in this task? You know, it's always something that's just out of sight. Is the short answer, Judith? I mean, what do I have in common? I'm a Jewish girl from Massachusetts. What do I have in common with a Hellenistic queen? I mean, we weren't even both born in Newark. I mean, there's just no, no common ground, right? So, you know, I do think there is, there's clearly some kind of resonance, whether it's obvious to the biographer, whether it comes with the work, whether it half eludes one or not, there's obviously something there. But, but then there is this troubling thing about biography, which is that all of us will, with the same materials, write a different book. And because different things will resonate with each of us. And I had this sort of humbling and troubling experience with my first book um, where the saint exupéry had had an extremely contentious, very difficult marriage with a woman who was in short a mythomaniac, um, as one might argue was he. And there was one set of extremely um, uh, open letters which had were with the son of the man to whom the little prince is dedicated. And this, he had never really shown them to any biographer and I went down to see him in central France and he spent the afternoon with me sort of reading certain letters and then putting other letters over at the far end of the table. And then at a certain point he got up to make tea but he was gone for an incredibly long time and I realized that 
I was meant to read the letters at the other end of the table, but only while he was out of the room, which mm. I did. And of course, this led completely different light on the Saint-Exupéry marriage. And it made it clear to me anyway, that the wife had been the very difficult party. And there was a lot of you know cheating on everybody and living in different places. At about the same time that my book came out, came out another book biography of Saint-Exupéry in England, to which the biographer had, for which the biographer had also clearly had access to the same letters and he would come down on exactly the opposite side. Mm. So, you know, here was a set, a set of extremely sensitive documents never before seen and two people, one of us male, one of us female, perhaps that was the reason, read them completely differently. So, you know, does one bring something to the table? Yes, possibly things one isn't even, of which one isn't even entirely aware. Mm. Um, it's so interesting. Martha, going back to Gibbon for a minute, uh, you talked for a little bit about your clear antipathy to his misogyny and to his, but I, I happen to know that you, you also have a deep, there's, there's, you feel deep affection. I, I don't know if affection is the right word. You, you can define it for yourself. Um, what's the nature of your, your relationship with Gibbon? I mean, you have, he's, he's, uh, he's sort of in the, in the, in the, in the, um, um, the room, the the salon of your of your books, He's, uh, you know, it, I don't know how that dinner party would work out with Jane Manson, Louisa May Alcott, Mary Washington, and Kim. It might be great, but <laughs> I think I might not attend. But uh, I think uh, I actually uh, do feel great af affection for Gibbon, particularly in, in in his early years. He had a perfectly dreadful childhood. Um, he was uh, born into the, n not the very elite, but the upper class in, in Great Britain. He had a, his mother had seven pregnancies and he was the seven children. Some of them were actu actually became children, but all, but he, Gibbon was the only one who survived of all of those pregnancies and, and uh, tiny children who died. He was very sickly. His father was uh, melodramatic and impulsive and, um, and, and kind of really kind of mean in certain ways. Um, and so uh, Gibbon was um, terribly, um, he was a very special child with what we would think of as sort of special needs. He fortunately had an aunt the uh, the sister of his mother, who took good care of him and coddled him and let him read everything he wanted to read. So he had an unusual and sort of, in some ways, useless education. But he was he was better read than any other youngster in in England probably at the time. But he didn't have the classics, so he wasn't really prepared for school. Nor was he prepared emotionally or physically to really go to school. His father did try and get him into school uh, and he, he went to Oxford for a, a brief period of time until he converted to Catholicism to his father's utter dismay and was exiled to, to, uh, to Switzerland to, um, uh, to sort of cure that condition. The, th the thing that touches me so much about him is, is that I, I, you imagine this 14 year old child who speaks really only English being dropped down into the into the family of a Calvinist minister and his wife, who um, will take good but Spartan care of the, of this child. He speaks no French at the time that he gets there. He he's is thrown out of England. I think for I, I think he has to leave four or five days after he's revealed to his father his his. Um, shift to Catholicism. And, and he's this spindly little um, unwell person. And he has to create a human being, you know, he has to create a viable human being out of that. And his prodigious mind is what his memory, his ability to just cut everything out, um, but, but focus on the studies at hand uh, are what save him. He learned French you know, very, very rapidly. He learned French and Latin at the same time, going back and forth between the two languages. He, um, it's, it's, uh, it's an extraordinary resilience and, and sort of self, 
self-making that that touches me very much he naturally with this kind of upbringing or lack of upbringing there were great aspects of sort of sterile parts of his character parts of his character that that he turns into he he, he becomes a parody of himself much later in life for lack of the skills of intimacy which he never really develops uh except in the he has he has a couple of very very close friendships but other than that he really doesn't um sure so but so yes i think he's he's both heartbreaking and incredibly irritating <laughs> <laughs> sounds like <laughs> sounds like everybody um, you know yeah um so Stacey, you said you never wanted, you didn't want to write the same book twice. And Paul, you've been sort of tirelessly experimental in your fiction, in your films. Uh, but but Burning Boys is a pretty straightforward um, factual narrative. I, I'd like to ask everybody, really, if you at this point, 2022, I think it is, uh, is there room in biography in this century for formal experimentation? Have we come to the end of the you know, just sort of the 19th century um, version of the biography. Of course, there's you know, shorter ones you can have, you can have focused ones, but but is there room for the kind of, for, for, for yeah. Yes, I believe so because, um, and I read it and um, in, the, in the 1980s, there's a German writer named Hilgesheimer who wrote a biography of Mozart, not terribly long, 300, 320 page book, which is not a biography of Mozart, but how one might go about writing a biography of Mozart. I found it one of the most thrilling meditations on this whole question that I've ever encountered. I would recommend that book highly, if any, if it's still in print, I'm mm. sure you can find it. I think it's just called Mozart. Mm. And uh, uh, that was an inspiring book. I didn't want to do that with my subject, but I could see how tempting uh, a figure such as Mozart would be, you know, for this kind of reflection that uh, was, it's thrilling. Um, and I'm sure there are other ways of approaching the telling of other lives that, that could be just as thrilling, so. And you're not tempted <laughs> yourself? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a novel now. So, but of course, when I'm doing that, it's the same thing, isn't it, right? Yeah, I mean, it telling the stories of people's lives and from, different angles, different different approach. As David said, you, you don't want to write the same book. You want to keep reinventing yourself. But you've had such beginner's luck because you had a subject who died young. Do you realize how what a gift that is to the biographer? <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. But still, it was uh, it was such a dense life. I, I think he experienced more than most people do in 70 or 80 years of life. It's uh, incredible. But I wanted to ask all of you who are real prose. The most daunting thing for me was not writing the text, but all the other stuff. I had to, I, I have, I don't know, more than a thousand notes. It took me weeks to compile all this stuff. And then, um, you know, tracking down photographs and archives, which were mostly shut, you know, during the pandemic when I, because I finished writing the body of the book in February of 2020, just before we all locked down. And then, and then the index, um, you know, I'd never worked with an index before. It, it, it made my head spin. <laughs> I hired an indexer and I, I got this thing, it was double spaced, it was 160 pages. And the, and the um, production manager told me, oh, for the index, there's no proofreader. And so I <laughs> so. sat there, and it was two weeks proofreading and changing the index. The person did a good job, but there were things missing and things that were too finely nuanced to be, to be in, the, in, the, in the index. So I worked on it and I thought, this is what they do if they want, if, if you want to send someone to hell, make that person <laughs> sit and have to proofread an index. I they actually think they might have done that to you to make sure you would write a novel next. <laughs> that is, because that is absolutely the way to relieve anyone ever of wanting to write another biography. <laughs> yeah, but right. I mean, you all go through this, right? The, the three of you. No, uh, no. I, 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 someone did the index for me. I, to me, that sort of busy work was after the torture of writing, after the torture of, 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 
of, of digesting and distilling these, these big lives, I would have happily proved your index for you if you would have written a couple of chapters for me. I think I would have. <laughs> <laughs> but Stacey, what do you feel about experimentation? I feel like there's an enormous amount of it going on. I mean, I feel very sort of optimistic on that front, both in terms of essayistic views and half-lives and truncated lives. I think people are actually playing around in an incredibly thrilling way. I, I do wish somebody would share the British formula for how you can put your pen down one afternoon and pick it up the next. But I mean, even Paul, you insert your you insert yourself in the first person into your book. I mean, that's something that is a departure too. A couple um, of times with the crane. Uh, yeah, but that's up, unusual. We grew up partly in Asbury Park. Well, I used to go to Asbury Park as a kid, <laughs> and I didn't know that it had started as a Methodist stronghold. Um, you know, in around the 1860s or 70s. Um, so I said, you know, when I went there, it was just a fun, fun place, you know, with boardwalk and roller coasters and amusement park. But that was all, I think maybe that's it. A couple of times, maybe, just briefly, I bring in myself. I wanted to um, disappear, pretty much. But I figured, look, I can do whatever I want. And, and so when it seemed appropriate, I, I, I did make some uh, personal references. Uh, I was fascinated, for example, by the friendship of Crane and Joseph Conrad. They were so close during the years that Crane was in England. Uh, I think each for the other was the brother they never had, the, the literary brother, the soulmate. And, um, um, I have been a novelist all these years and I have friendships with other novelists, a few very intimate friendships. And it was so fascinating to see for me how they too rarely, if ever, talked about their work. And this is a thing that novelists never do. We don't talk about our work with each other. Maybe a small tip of the hat for this. Good job with this. Yeah, I like that that sentence. But then you talk about baseball or politics or what you're going to have for dinner, and that's your friendship with your fellow novelist, and that's the way they were. Crane kept coming up with ideas for them to collaborate on plays so they could make money. They were both broke all the time, but nothing ever came of it. But Conrad had a great fun, I think watching his younger friend, you know, invent these outrageous <laughs> uh, stories for plays that didn't get more than half an inch off the ground. But uh, I, I want to just break in here because we want to leave time for questions. Um, and actually, Kai has a very good question, which sort of I'd like to ask both um, Stacy and, and Martha. He, he says, what are the different challenges you face in writing about a writer versus writing about a political or other historical figure? Hmm. You want to go first, Martha? Uh, sure. I, I, um, I, I haven't really the the biography I'm doing on on Gibbon right now is in some ways less about his writing than about his life, because everybody who's dealt with Gibbon writes about his work, and it's been written about so copiously that what I really wanted to focus on was a more personal aspect of his, of his life. And that, um, so that for me has um, uh, created a sort of a, a route that I can follow through the material that is, again, so copious, I, you know, I, I don't think I could possibly master it all. Um, for me, it's much, uh, I'm trying to think the, Al, the Alcott book um, for me was a, another exercise, of course, in writing about, uh, writing about a writer. And in that case, I was writing about somebody who'd written one of my favorite books of all time. And the problem for me there was to sort of separate the life of Alcott from the life of Joe and, and um, the characters that she'd created because previous biographers had sort of seen, had melded them and had sort of, if they hadn't, if the facts weren't exactly the same, they had made the tone of Louisa May Alcott's life seem as if it was the tone of, of Joe March's life, it was sort of sunny with problems, but you resolve them 
uh, with um, great love, generosity, self-sacrifice, and, and a moral system that that brings everyone ultimate happiness, if not if not immediate happiness. Um, I I found her work in that sense. Um, psychologically and emotionally very useful for for telling this story. Um, I, I think I'm getting- I'm, um, No, no, we were talking about why a writer is different from a historical figure. And that's one of the great reasons, I think, that you have the texts, you have the- You have, you have all this stuff, which you, which you can't, which you can't have to use very carefully as, as everyone who's ever done this knows. It's not, people don't um, just tell you, give you a roadmap to who they are. And um, and there, but uh, and there in, in Alcott's case, her her written work was um, concealed a, a really truly dreadful story, and it was it was it was for me sort of the the process of of trying to figure out what her family life actually had been like, which was pretty dreadful, um, and. Uh, you, you know, not being seduced by the family life I wanted her to have and would have wanted myself to have had because because I read Little Women so many times that was that was the life I dreamed of. Um, yeah, Judith, yeah. do you want to? No, no, I, I, no, 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 Stacey, I just wanted to let you I, get a word in on that subject. Yeah, too. no, I just I just wanted to sort of say two things which pretty much follow on what Martha said. One is that it's fabulous and treacherous to write about a writer in the sense that um, narratively speaking, a writer on his best day sits alone in a room and writes. And that's not terribly thrilling from a narrative point of view. Some of us can make it thrilling, many of us can't. And so you have the problem of does the, does the biography come to a screeching halt so that you can discuss the literature or does the biography move along at a, at a more measured pace? That's one problem. But the other problem, of course, is as Martha touched on, reading the life and the work and how much you're, and I would love at some point to talk about how we've all handled autobiography, which to me is like a, you know, a, a sump hole into one, to one falls. Um, but in the case of Nabokov, for example, friends always swore that the gift, which is an autobiographical novel, was more true to the life than was speak memory with the memoir. And of course, Nabokov spent his life saying it's not an autobiographical novel, except when he didn't. So there's the untangling there of the life and the work, which mix themselves up with each other and which the biographer has to very delicately uh, begin to pry apart and, and I think not overread. And that's, right. that's really dangerous territory. Right. I would just add to that that Gibbon wrote six autobiographies. Um, he only finished one and then he wrote a memoir. And so you, you how to parse these various ways he wanted to render himself in an age in which people were you know, supposed to construct themselves uh, is 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 really treacherous. It's very it's a very hard thing to do. Who was it who said that autobiography is the perfect vehicle for telling the truth about other people? Because <laughs> 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 that's the problem always, right? I mean, it's, right. it's kind no, it's, of it's kind of muddy ground. No, Denison Denison encodes her inner life, her conflicts in her tales, but out of Africa is invented. Out of Africa is a sort of self idealization. It's uh, it's a wonderful book for many reasons, but it's um, it's hardly uh, the truth of her life in Africa that that uh, I discovered early on. Um, we have a lot of questions. So I'm just going to keep moving on. Um, Robert Solomon asks Paul, uh, I was interested in what you said about filling in biographical history where it's missing. Can you speak a bit more about this? I'm in my eighth year of research about an abstract expressionist. Um, so there's sort of more detail about this, about Mr. Solomon's book. Um, but can you, can you talk more about the process of filling in, filling in the missing or not filling in or leaving the gaps there? Well, I, 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 I thought I should take the approach of being, you know, absolutely honest with the reader and say, we don't know. But this might have happened, this might have happened. There was a, one instance in the book Crane fell in love with a woman um, when he was about 20. Um, and she was maybe 21. She was married, however, but unhappily married. And he really carried the torch for her for, for years. 
and um, nothing ever happened. He wanted her to elope with him, and she was tempted, but but didn't. Um, so he, after he was living in England for about a year, he, he returned to America on his way to Cuba to cover the Spanish-American War. And um, it seems that he stopped in Washington where this woman lived, Lily, and, um, and proposed to her. But then again, maybe he didn't. And, um, and so I, I tried to play out this thing where, well, if he had proposed to her, why did he do it? I mean, he was already living with someone else and they were living as Mr. and Mrs. And um, I, I, I just feel that I, I said, it's, it's quite possible that even though, you know, first loves often end, they don't really die. And that he saw her again and he was so overwhelmed that it just came out of him, this, this proposal. She said, no. And that was the end of it. Uh, and I, I tried to, I, I can imagine, I mean, it's, I can't, I, we all know it's quite possible to be in love with two people at the same time. And um, so anyway, going around these things, trying to keep my feet on the ground with it and to be as honest as possible, I, I, don't, I don't really present any solutions, but I think I, I present some plausible alternatives about this particular thing which is certainly not the most important thing in the book, but it's, it's important because he cared so much about this Lily Brandon Monroe. Um, um, there's a question from Felicity or Stacy. You said that writing biography is partly pulling someone out of obscurity. Is that a challenge you seek when searching for a new subject, a person who is misunderstood or lost to history? I think for me, it generally comes down to one of those two or at least in retrospect, it has come down to one of those two things. I mean, I think you're by definition looking for the book that isn't on the shelf, right? I mean, you don't wanna write a book that's already there. Um, and so often that is someone who either has, has been lost or someone who's been trampled or someone who's been read only. I mean, when I, when I first started reading Cleopatra biographies, most of them had been written, many of them had been written in the 50s and they were by male authors and they usually talked about how kittenish she was. I mean, this is a woman who ruled an enormous expanse of the world. Um, so there was definitely a sense of wanting to walk back um, preconceptions and added misconceptions. Um, you know, is there somebody whom I think we well understand who could merit a new biography? Sure, but I tend usually to look in the more obscure corners, I think. Um, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't seem to me like you're adding value. It doesn't seem to me like I'm adding value otherwise. That, that's really interesting. Um, a very good question from, from Thad. Um, what remains unchanged about biography, no matter how radically different the subjects are? That is to say, having swerved from one sort of one subject to another, one sort of subject to another, what's not different about the experience? You're still fighting with your hands tied behind your back because you can't make anything up. I hate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the end notes, right, Paul? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, listen, I've, I've written autobiographical books also. Um, that's not biography. Uh, we, we know that. But it's, it's, it's a biography in any case. Uh, and I don't think of them as autobiographies either. I think of them as using myself to meditate on certain things that are common to all of us, essentially. Um, but, um, and, and those books have taken, you know, many, many, many different forms. Um, and there, but what drives me, the underlying it is, and I'm, I hope I have made a pact with the reader that I'm telling the truth as far as I know it. I'm not saying that I can remember everything, but when I, I don't remember, I say I don't remember. I mean, so many memoirs, particularly, you have authors recreating dialogue they supposedly overheard when they were four years old, going on for pages. Now, I can't even remember what we said to each other at the beginning of this discussion. And you're <laughs> gonna tell me, 50 years later, you can remember a conversation you, you heard or took part in. It's not humanly possible. So I think 
not to lie on purpose is 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 the is the <laughs> fundamental thing about autobiography and biography. That's that's the thing that joins them. It's absorbed in the breach. I I want I just I want think, to go ahead. If, if I could just uh, the one yeah. thing that always seems to me paramount about a good biography is that it provides a context for the character and that and that whatever that context is you have to it's your obligation to steep yourself in it and to learn it as well as you can and to and to explain things to readers so that they understand what a thing means in a given place in a given time I um, and it seems to me if you, if you, you're it, absolutely a hundred percent right about that and um I mean, I've read some wonderful biographies like Ernest Pavel's uh, Kafka biography or uh, Mello's biography of Hawthorne. Mm. Both of them masterfully tell about the period. They situate their- Their the social histories. In, in the time yeah. and the place, as Martha just said. And I think you have, if you don't do that, then you're really not doing your job. I, I, I agree completely. I think that, that social, social history is the bedrock of biography and, and that, um, and, and also because we resemble the members of our generation in a way right. more than we resemble our parents or, or um, our ancestors or members of our clan or tribe. So you have to, um, you have to understand the generation. I think what's, what stays the same for me is stayed the same for me is how difficult it is, how arduous it is to feel certain that I have the authority to say what I need to say, because um, that is partly a question of time and reading and research and in all of those French archives, which I may be going back to at some point. Uh, uh, and, it, it, and, and also being confident in what you, in, in weighing things, in, in, as Paul was saying also, with, don't say anything untrue, do no harm. So for me, the challenge that stays the same is at what point do I have the authority to say, to, 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 to pronounce uh, as, a, as a critic, as a life writer about this subject? But I just want to add, as the only novelist in the group, the same applies to writing fiction as well. You can't lie. And when you write a, a sentence, yeah, right. a bad sentence, and you see that you're faking it, you, 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 have to, you have to be very severe and get rid of it. You have to go down, down, down into where some truth might, might exist. That's the whole adventure of writing in general, whether fiction or nonfiction. You have to you have to be as honest as possible. Otherwise, why do it? What, what, let, let me ask you a question. Let me ask all of you a question in relation to that, which is to say, you know, you you have to make judgments. There are certain things you can't verify. There are certain things, even if you can verify them, you don't know that they're ver veritable. How do you know? How do you judge the truth of something? How do you how do you finally decide if you're if you're if you're if you've you've found the truth about something? I've always gone with what what Paul described of being able to say I don't know on the page or we can't be certain on the page or to inject some element of doubt which I think is reassuring both to the writer and to the reader um or to, or in the case of Cleopatra for example doing Cleopatra dies twice in that biography because we don't know which account is actually true and they're mm -hmm. very different accounts so she's there was no other way to do it except to let her die twice but just making it clear that you are an imperfect you are you are telling an imperfect narrative with imperfect sources and often having to dart around enormous absences of material i just think that's re a relief at both ends of the of the, of the transaction so what is go, go sorry go ahead martha no I just to say one of the reasons i wrote the biography of of mary ball washington was that so much had been invented about her and so much had been just because because there was so little actual evidence um, it seemed incredibly important to contextualize as thickly as I possibly could so that whatever you did say, yeah. you, still, you still have to say it with humility and you have to say it with the possibility that you're, that you're wrong and offer another, you know, another, if there is one, another reasonable uh, explanation for, for whatever. But um, yeah. Okay. So that's an excellent example of a biography that is, is, has, is in which you, the richness comes from a context with, because you didn't have that much um, to work with, you didn't have diaries, you didn't, she, didn't, she, wasn't, she didn't write very much, she had some letters, but you also give a context to the supporting characters in an extremely important way, 
the enslaved people whom she owned and her relationship with them. And, um, uh, and, and also, again, with the problem of documentation being a great challenge. In, in, right, and, right. But I, th I think biography just humbles you. I mean, yeah, you, you, you cannot know certain things. And I was actually, Paul, I was curious um, when I was, I, I read, um, I was, when I was reading your biography, it has this um, joyous certitude because there's stuff that you just found stuff that was so interesting and you, and you were writing about it. And I wondered if that same joy applies to material that you make up when you're writing a novel. Oh, that's very interesting. No, I'm in a different place. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in a place of such deep struggle. I, joy is not a word that ever... <laughs> in the novel, no. But I, I really did enjoy writing about Crane's work. Yeah. Because it wasn't mine. And I could just right. appreciate it and, and, and right. see what was good in it. Right. Um, so Kai would like to know if you are... Kai would like to know if it's harder to be a biographer than a novelist or vice versa. That's for you. I, I feel that writing is hard, period. And um, um, if you're gonna do it well, I think the level of difficulty is equal. Some people are absolutely not cut out to write nonfiction. Other people are only cut out to write you know, fiction. And then uh, some people can, can, can go back and forth. Um, it's all about who, who's doing it, what the sensibility is behind it. And, but I think um, perhaps the fact that I have mostly written fiction can also write nonfiction has something to do with how I think about fiction, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. Um, if anyone, if there are no last questions, this has been a, for me a wonderful and really interesting conversation. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, Paul Oster, Stacey Schiff, Martha Saxton, also uh, Kai Bird, and um, Shelby, Shelby White for her continuing support of the Leon Levy Foundation and the Center for Biography. And I'd like to thank the, the audience who um, didn't get a chance to rub shoulders, but um, got a chance to rub noses with the screen. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you, Judith. Thank you, so thank, thank you Paul. Later. Thank you, Martha. Good night. Thank you, Stacy. Good night. 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 Good night.